Hey, you just tapped and dropped in one of the most amazing sermons on the net today. Welcome to CNBC. Get ready to have your spirit uplifted and prepare to dive into God's Word. Enjoy today's broadcast. Brother Yeager, I got to witness with your pen the other day in Arby's restaurant. Somebody looked at it and said, that's a beautiful pen. I said, yes, a friend of mine made that for me, pulled it out, explained to him what the olive wood was about, what the ebony was about, and what all of the beautiful symbols that were there of Christian faith. Now, didn't have a chance to go ahead and sit down with them because our order came and they went and sat down. But that shows you how quickly somebody can be witness to with some object that you have that represents Jesus. Just like the little three-circle bracelets, those things would come in real handy. God is working. How many of you all invited somebody this week? Raise your hands. Look here. Got several folks that raised and have invited folks to come. And the more we do that, the more God's going to bless that. Barna says 84% of the people that come to church and seek salvation are invited by a friend. Doesn't matter how much I preach over here. Matter of fact, it says 4% of those who come and get saved are saved through the preaching of the word. They come because you're concerned for their souls. Have we got mercy on the people that are lost? I'm going to look at that this morning. Before I do so, I want you to know that 57 years ago, I stood as a nervous bridegroom before a good friend of ours who was about to perform our marriage. And as Mary walked up the aisle, my best man said, it's not too late to back out. She heard him and reminded me of that several years later. Today is our 57th anniversary. And if I use my P's and Q's right, we might make 58. In Matthew, the fifth chapter, seventh verse, it says this, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much that this message that was given by our Lord and Savior on the, on the mount, as he preached to the 5,000, as he gave them the things that were necessary for Christian life, and what the cost would be for us surrendering to serve the kingdom of God. Help us, Lord, to understand best what mercy is about, so that we might too, because we've obtained mercy, be able to share mercy. Bless your word as it goes forth. In Jesus' name do we pray. Amen. What does mercy mean? The meaning of mercy. Compassion, kindness, charity, goodness, devotion, tenderness, and helpfulness. That's the definition of mercy. Mercy is all of those things in one word. I remember watching the movie Spartacus. And when they were called into the arena to fight one another, Spartacus was to fight one of his followers. And the command was that whoever lost could cry out mercy. And the king or governor or whoever was in charge of the arena would say to the crowd, thumbs up or thumbs down. If thumbs up, mercy was given. If thumbs went down, the person lost their life. Aren't we glad that Jesus didn't turn a thumb down on us? That God didn't turn his thumb down on us? Because that mercy was shown to us as sinners. In Matthew the 9th, chapter verse 36 it says this but when he saw the multitude he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd Jesus when he saw the multitude lifted up his eyes and he looked and many were coming I've been watching the series chosen here lately and I've always wondered uh, I think what they're doing is trying to put that into an understandable type of situation Somebody says, well, it's not following Scripture right. Did you ever notice that the name of the company that is producing it is? It's called the Out of Order Company. 
It doesn't mean that they are going to be chronologically correct. It means that they're trying to give us an understanding of how these events could have taken place. And it does a great deal for me and for others as we see this vision. And the last one that I watched here the other day was the fact of Jesus preaching to the multitude on a hillside. The feeding of the 5,000. It was nothing like I imagined it to be. But it was a good depiction of that. Because the people were coming from Decapolis. And there had been a great deal of... of, uh, disruption that had happened because two of the disciples that Jesus had sent out went and preached to Decapolis and gave an illustration that turned everybody into a fighting mood, all the different ethnical groups that was in Decapolis. It was supposed to be to the Jews, but some of the Gentiles overheard the preaching, and it had caused a ruckus in Decapolis. And so Jesus had to go with the rest of his disciples to try to temper down the harsh feelings. And he met him in the field. There were several groups that came to him. See, the Bible tells us that Jesus was followed. His preaching drew people. And people wanted to know what this man was saying. Not just the Jews, even though they were sent strictly to the Jews at first, but when the Gentiles heard of Jesus and his compassion. They wanted to understand it. Praise God, because if we hadn't had Gentiles finding out the word of God, we would be in trouble. Because we're not Jews, we're Gentiles. But as the message he began to proclaim to these faction of people, several different ones, there was the Greeks, there was the Jews, there was the Corinthians, there were the folks from Decapolis, there were the ones that were from out into Asia, down into Africa. All of these were part of Decapolis. It was a melting pot. And as the crowd came, you could see the confusion and the disrest that was there. But as Jesus began to preach, you began to see a peace fall upon them. And before the night was over, there were thousands that were there because Jesus had compassion on the people. Mercy. Let me ask you something. How much mercy do we have for our area? How much compassion do we have for the 50% of people that are lost in our four county area? It figures over 50,000 people. There's over 100,000 people now in our four county area. We've got 34 churches that I know of that are serving in just the Baptist faith. Other uh, churches that are evangelical serving as well. And yet there is half the population of our area is lost without Jesus. How much compassion do we have on them? How much compassion do we have individually on our friends and our neighbors and our kinfolk? You say, you don't know my kinfolk, they're rotten. I think Jesus died for the rotten. He died for the good and the rotten. He had compassion for the people. He was moved with compassion. He saw that they were literally fainting. This is why he fed the 5,000. He told his disciples, he said, listen, these folks have been with me all night and now... It's getting towards morning and they've not had anything to eat. And he told his disciples, you go and buy bread for them. Now, Judas was there because Judas was the money carrier. And he spoke up and said, Lord, what we have would not even be able to buy enough for 12 to eat. Yet one of the disciples had saw a young man that had a bag with him that had two fishes and five loaves. And Jesus said, bring it here. And he blessed it and he broke it. And the Bible says that they began to pass it out. And there was 12 basket loads of scraps left over. And he asked the number. Matthew, by the way, was the guy who numbered 
kept things in order. Matthew, if you ever read the book of Matthew, you'll see that it was probably somebody who was an accountant that wrote it because he was very precise in how it reads. He was a tax collector. And he numbered the people. He said there were at least 5,000 men and women. Don't know how many other children. How many other groups? We don't know exactly how many the 5,000 is recorded. You see, Jesus had compassion enough to see a miracle was needed and performed a miracle and everybody was fed. How well do we feed? How well do we meet the need of the weak and the scattered and to the sheep that have no shepherd? You see, that's what mercy is all about. In Isaiah 53, 6, it says that all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus was prepared to take it all. Mercy for the sorrowful. We as Christians ought to have mercy for the unwanted. In Mark 1, 41, it says, Then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said, I'm willing, be cleansed. Who did he say that to? He said that to the leper who came. He healed not only a leper, but he also healed ten lepers at one time, and only one came back. Jesus had compassion. Jesus heals. When he heals, he doesn't heal just the body. He heals the soul. He takes away the sin that has tainted us and would keep us from God, and he takes that away completely so that we stand before God unaccused. When Satan comes down and starts to accuse us, Jesus said, wait a minute, that's my child. He's forgiven. God could not judge us because when he sees us, he sees his son in front of us because he died for our sins. He had mercy on our souls. Mercy for the unlovely. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made made and baptized more disciples than John, Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples. He left Judea and departed, but he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, and near the plot of the ground where Jacob gave to his son. Now Jacob's well was there, and Jesus therefore, being weary from his journey, thus said by the well, it's about the sixth hour. We all know the story that took out less. He met a woman there. A woman that was basically shunned by most of the community. She came at the sixth hour because that was the time that most people did not go to the well. She came quietly, lonely, to draw water. Jesus met her there, asked her for a drink. And she recognized that Jesus was a Jew. She said, how is it that you ask me for a drink? You are a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. Now, the Samaritans were a mixed-blood people. They were formerly Jews that had married into the uh, heathen culture around. And literally, they had begun to worship in all different ways. She was unclean as far as the rest of the Jews were. Matter of fact, the disciples chastised Jesus. said, why do we need to go through Samaria? He said, I've got an appointment there. Folks, I want you to know that Jesus makes divine appointments with us for him to meet us. And when we meet him, it should change our lives. It changed hers. He told her everything she had done. He told her that she was an uh, unmarried woman that was in an adulterous relationship at this point in time. And rather than get offended, it softened the woman's heart and she realized that this man knew more about her than even her best friend. And he offered her water from the living well that she would never have to drink again. How much change did it take place there in that woman's life? So much so that she went back to the city and became a witness for Jesus. 
She was so excited about what Jesus had done in her life and how he had changed her and how he had given her salvation and mercy upon her. She had to tell everybody, how excited are we about our salvation? How excited are we about the fact that Jesus had mercy on us and we would not have to seek sin again? That mercy changed her life. There's mercy for the sick. In Matthew 25, 34, Jesus is talking to the uh, disciples and they ask him, you know, what, or one, one ask him how to be saved. It says, then the king will say to those on his right hand, come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and clothed me, and I was sick, and you visited me. And I was in the prison, and you came to me. Jesus is telling his disciples, folks, I want you to know what's going to be a requirement for salvation and mercy is the fact that we meet the need of the person that we're talking to. If they're sick, we need to help them. If they're hungry, we need to feed them. If we are If they are naked, we need to clothe them. If they're in prison, we need to go and visit with them. Isn't it interesting that Jesus talked about the prison ministry? Not only captive physically, but captive in their soul, in their spirit to sin. See, Jesus tells us as disciples that we ought to have mercy upon them rather than condemn them and judge them. By the way, when you start judging folks that are in the prison, you need to understand they've already been judged. They've already been condemned. What we need to do is bring them mercy and salvation through Jesus Christ. Now, it may not set them free from that physical prison, but it will set them free from the spiritual prison that they're in. We're going to meet a whole lot of prisoners in heaven, folks. I want you to know that. Prisoners that have had the opportunity to change because of the word that has been taken into the prison. Somebody had mercy on them. And we need to have mercy on those. You see, the hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, the naked, the sick, the prisoner. These are six classes of tip, uh, that are typical in the world today. Each class is included. These people need mercy shown to them not judgment. Yesterday I was coming to the breakfast, the men's prayer breakfast over at IHOP. Took the highway, got down to exit 81, and I was coming up on that exit that stopped just before you get on Asher and then turn down to uh, come to where IHOP and him is. I saw a family, a man, a woman, two children, and a dog all sitting beside the road in that heat. God told me, he says, you got $5 in your pocket, give it to them. And I thought, Lord, what would $5 do for me? He says, you don't know, give it to them. So I stopped, I held up traffic, I had people honking at me. And I gave them the $5. Matter of fact, I had to get the woman's attention because she was dealing with one of the children and I said, hey, come here. And she says, oh, okay. And she came over and took the $5. She said, sir, you don't know what this is going to do. We never know what God's going to call us to do and how it will affect the people. Now, I may never see them again. But I learned that I better hear God's voice and do what I'm told. And I thought to myself when I was coming into the restaurant, well, it's a good thing I listened to him because I think I'm supposed to be preaching on mercy tomorrow. And if I can't show mercy, how can I preach on mercy? Mercy for the suffering. There are folks that are mentally suffering. There are folks that are physically suffering. There are folks that are bereaved. In our prayer list, there are several that are there because of bereavement. They've lost someone in their life. Some are unsure if that person is saved or not. We're supposed to show mercy for the lonely in the world. Loneliness is a terrible thing. 
It hurts to know that you're all alone, that all of those around you are gone. I'm on our class uh, Facebook. And every once in a while, I'll get our high school Facebook. And every once in a while, I'll get a statement from one of the others, so-and-so has passed away. Now, understand that my high school, we had 405 graduate from our class. I'm thinking that probably almost half of those are gone. I don't know for sure. But every once in a while, matter of fact, this last year, I've had about 12 that have said that this one or that one has passed. And I keep telling, man, that's getting closer to me, you know, because I knew these people. I grew up with them. They were friends of mine in high school, and they're passing away. And I'm thinking of the families that they are involved in. My fault the other day is, I wonder how many folks this is affecting because I know they've went out and they've had children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Everybody's affected by it. How sorry am I for those families? And the fact now that that wife or that husband is now alone. The neat thing about it is that Christ will never leave or forsake us. Once we accept him, he's with us, even in our loneliest hours. There are those that are suffering discouragement. We need to show mercy by giving encouragement to those. If they've lost a job, if they've had a bad term of events in their life, we need to be there to encourage them. That's part of what Christianity is all about. For us to have mercy to give them encouragement. Folks, we are called as the church to the ministry of reconciliation. And we can't reconcile unless we have mercy on those that we're dealing with. Just as Christ had mercy on us, we are to show mercy as well. Have you had the opportunity to know Christ as your Savior? Do you realize how He gave you mercy? Maybe you haven't accepted Him yet, but we're going to give you an opportunity to do that. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to invite you to come today and experience that mercy that relieves you from the debt of sin. No longer will you have to worry about where you're going to go if you die. Because if you belong to the Master, we go to Him. Thanks for joining us here today. We hope that you enjoyed the message and it made an impact in your life. Hey, you want to make sure and visit with us on the web at mycmbc.us. Also, be sure to stop by our Facebook page and follow the ministry of Crow Mountain Baptist Church. You can find it at facebook.com forward slash Crow Mountain Baptist. Tune in next week for another amazing message. Have a great week. Thank you.